Hi friends, Lorelai here from Blade & Broom. It's great to have you this week. And this time we're gonna be talking about why witches need to study some metaphysics. And um, I have noticed over the years that I've been studying that uh, not nearly enough of us get this basic metaphysical education as part of our training, including me. I didn't in the beginning. So um, I wanted to kind of address that with everybody today and say by all means necessary, it's available, avail yourself of it. And I'm gonna like right off the bat, um, encourage you, there's a new book that has just recently been published by Matt Oren um, called Psychic Witch, and it's about metaphysics for witches. It is very accessible for folks that are coming from a witchcraft background. If this is a new topic and I am giving you some eye-opening information in this video that you haven't um, addressed for yourself before, or maybe you've only like dabbled in the surface of it, go get this book. And it's available in Kindle and it's available in paperback. Get it, because um, it's gonna approach it from witchcraft language, not from serial, serial monial. <laughs> not from ceremonial magic or occult language that might seem a little inaccessible if you're coming from a more folkloric or traditional background. Um, but it's going to help you sort of get into understanding the kinds of things that I'm going to tell you today that I think you need to know. So a lot of folks are going to approach this right from the start and say, I don't really need to know that because my craft doesn't involve that. But I'm going to let you know that I think it does. And here's why. So witches need to know the difference between magic and sorcery. We tend to call everything magic in this day and age. Sometimes we spell it with a K and that's like a whole other issue that I'm not going to go into. Um, <laughs> but, um, but there's a difference. Robin Artisan actually writes about this. So I would encourage you to look into his work to get more of a feel for, for where I'm coming from on this topic. But I am wholly in alignment with what he has to say on this. Um, because he's actually drawing from really, really old roots on this. Magic draws from the, the personal storehouse um, of the practitioner and their ability to tap into other sources. So their ability to tap into um, elemental sources, energetic sources, and maybe their ability to um, actually, no, I'm gonna stop right there. It doesn't tap into their ability to command and control spirits because that gets into sorcery. The Greeks actually had a different word for working with spirits. They called it Goetia, and that meant low magic or sorcery. Um, when they were doing work, when the ancients were doing work that involved working with energy, working with personal energy, working with the gods, working um, at a higher level, working with the mind, working on these other planes, they called it theurgy, they called it thaumaturgy. Um, it wasn't sorcery, it was magic, it was high magic. So there's this difference between high magic and low sorcery. Now, the ancients had some really distinct ideas about high equals good and elevated and superior and low is bad and not so good and witches and sorcerers were definitely in this like low bad category and i think that's bullshit so <laughs> people that are of that opinion can kind of just take that opinion and stick it right in their favorite ear like i don't care if you want to categorize me as a low magic practitioner and write me off because you think that I'm not tapped into something great and powerful, then go ahead and underestimate me, that's fine. Another thing that's really helpful to get an, a metaphysical education about is the models of, it would be both models of magic and sorcery, but the way that it typically gets described is the models of magic. Um, the person who actually started putting it in those terms was a person by the name of, um, writes under the name Frater UD. So um, for those that aren't familiar with the Fraters and Sorers of the world, um, Frater means brother. Um, and you can find his work um, in this particular 
um, piece of work that I'm referencing is called High Magic. And I'll include links and a card and all that kind of good stuff so you can um, you know, purchase these titles if you're interested in delving a little bit deeper. And he explores lots of metaphysical contexts and constructs from that ceremonial place that I was just referencing, which is a great place to look if you're not turned off by those ceremonial approaches. I'm certainly not. Um, I've mentioned before that I'm the uh, co-director at this point of the Babylon Rising Festival, but I didn't start out that way, you guys. I started as a, as a witch and a priestess of Aphrodite that came to the festival to present um, about sex magic and sacred sexuality and, and working with the white goddess of, of love and sexy stuff. So, um, you know, I came there and I kind of quickly realized that my magical education, my sorceress education, my metaphysical education was lacking. Um, and that as much knowledge as I had about traditional witchcraft and about the goddesses of love and the gods of love, <laughs> that I really needed to learn more about metaphysics and how the metaphysics were actually working. I could manipulate them and I could move them, but I didn't have language for what I was doing. And I didn't have um, a, a complete understanding of why things were working. So coming into contact with people, I actually moved in with them. <laughs> I moved into like a whole household with these people who were running the festival um, and got so much education about things like the models of magic and the fact that some people work entirely within um, a psychological model of magic in which the way that you're approaching magic is all in your head. It's all, um, it's all about how you're viewing it so that the spirits, what I would consider, what I do absolutely consider the spirits aren't entities out in the world that are separate from you. They're all projections of your own psychic universe. They're all part of your own construct. Um, and so by commanding them to do things, what you're really doing is sort of isolating parts of yourself and making yourself comply with yourself, um, which achieves ultimately the same result um, in the world. So um, really uh, the very well-known occultist Lon Milo Duquette writes from this perspective. So one of his book titles is actually called Low Magic, It's All in Your Head. You just have no idea how big your head is. And it's talking about manipulating the physical world, but through this psychological model of magic. So, um, and most of his work is about the psychological model of magic. If you actually approach it and you know that that's what he's talking about, you can see that psychological model influence in there. So another model, and I'm just gonna go through these briefly, but another model is the energy model. And it says that um, everything is energy and it's just energy that's been formed into these different um, constructs and that you can put energy into things and you can take energy away from things and you can manipulate that energy, move it around. Um, I am a big proponent of and, and a believer in, a follower of the spirit model. So, um, and I think a lot of witches are, not necessarily all witches, but I think a lot of traditional witches are. So we understand and work with um, a great number of spirit entities in the world and we see them as distinct individuals that are not us you know these are not projections of ourselves these are separate beings that we make deals with that we um, you know that we have relationships with and we try to engage in right relationship with those other beings and um, you know those might be for a particular period of time or for um, an extended period of time they might be for a lifetime it might be a loving relationship, it might be a contractual relationship, a business relationship. Um, it might be a familial relationship, a family relationship. So um, there's a whole spectrum of what that might be. And then there's um, a fourth model, which is the information model or the cyber model. And cyber just really means information in this case, which says that that energy or that spirit um, really is just a cluster of information that you have to program to do what it is that you want it to do. So it's just sitting there waiting to be told what to do. 
it's it's inert until you act upon it this is sort of the newest way one of the newer ways of looking at the world of magic and sorcery um, and so there's a little less that's written about it but it it really um, I think if I were to have to define it I would say that this is sort of the basis of what chaos magic is based on so um, and it's kind of a cool branch to look into. Um, and again, I get a lot of exposure to these concepts at Babylon Rising, which I'm gonna give a little plug for that, links and cards and all the nine yards. Um, if you're looking to really dive into an in-person magical education, metaphysical education, BR Festival is a great place to come and do that because we've got three tracks, like three separate programming areas that are happening that have workshops, discussions, rituals that are happening, and then people do spontaneous, like they do their own rituals throughout the event. Um, and we have traditional witches that come, we have chaos magicians. Actually, we have four now, because um, we were supposed to launch a new one this year in 2020, and it didn't happen because we didn't have the festival, but that will be happening the next time that we have the festival. So in 2021, we'll actually have four tracks of programming. So that's really exciting. But, um, and then people just bring stuff to do in terms of, you know, like all night long, there, there are rituals happening and people will come up to you going, hey, do you wanna to go to my ritual that's happening off in the woods somewhere? So that's really exciting. One thing that I think more witches need to understand that they don't right now is how energy moves in space and through space and through people, and through the physical world. Um, this is one of the sort of the basics of metaphysics that I think is drastically lacking in our metaphysical education as practitioners of witchcraft. It's not that it's not there in some way in the books, but I think a lot of us don't focus on it and we don't get what we need from it and we only get the tiniest portion. So I would like for you to think back about some of the books that you've read and think to the fact that you have seen, for instance, a diagram and an explanation of a quarter calling system and you've probably only seen one that has earth in the north air in the east, fire in the south, and water in the west. And I'm doing it oriented to myself, of course, so it's backwards for you, but that's okay. And this is the quarter calling system that you have probably only ever seen in a book. Um, and then I want you to think about the fact that you've probably seen two pentagrams drawn, and one will be an invoking pentagram and one will be a banishing pentagram and it will go in the opposite direction and they'll have some arrows and they'll have um, elemental names at each of the points. And now I want you to consider that there is, um, in terms of the pentagram, there is an invoking pentagram of earth and a banishing pentagram of earth and those are different than they are for the invoking pentagram of air and different than they are for the banishing pentagram of air, etc., etc., for invoking and banishing of water and of fire. And there are other ways to do the quarter calling, the quarter system, besides earth, air, fire, water. And the reason that the traditional Wiccan and the traditional hermet Hermetic, which is what you're used to seeing, earth, air, fire, water, quarter system is set up the way it is, is because it's like a magnet pushing the energy around the circle. And if you think about it, you can feel it. And here's the thing, in some books, they teach you that you're not starting with earth. The chance that we're used to start earth, air, fire, water. You've heard them. The earth, the air, the fire, the water, return, 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 return. But that's not how traditionally 
um, you're supposed to call the quarters, you're supposed to start with air. So if you're using that system, you're supposed to start with air. And the reason is you're supposed to start with the lightest and move to the densest. And, and it brings the energy down. So it brings the energy from up here down into the physical space. So air to fire to water to earth. Does that make sense? You get it, right? So it's the air is the lighter and it's starting with the masculine elements, right? You get that too? So the air, masculine, there are two things going on with the elements. There's uh, a positive and negative pull. And then, um, well, that's really, that's really it, right? So it's positive and negative. And then you have that, that denseness and that lightness, but that can also be described as sort of a positive and negative. So um, they tend to refer to it as masculine and feminine, but that's really sort of an old aeon way of looking at it. So we get light of light, dark of light, light of dark, dark of dark. And it, and it solidifies. We're bringing that sort of that heavenly, that upper realm energy from above to below. And we can do it the other way. We can go from here to below, from to further below. But what you don't get taught is that there are other ways to do it. So the Wittershins is actually doing it to go down. Um, that's why you do Wittershins is to go under. Um, it's not just that it's doing things backwards and that it's undoing things. It's not undoing anything. It's taking it down low. It's taking it chthonic. It's taking it into the underworld. And a lot of people are afraid of taking it into the underworld. So they're like, don't do that. You can't do that. But that's all that it's doing is it's taking it into the underworld. The way that some traditional craft groups call is not to create this bringing energy down um, from the heavens or to send energy back up through that spiral up to the heavens. What they do instead is to pair those pairs off. So for instance, in my tradition, the spiral castle tradition, which I've mentioned before is part of the American folkloric witchcraft system, we pair off earth, air and earth. They're the opposites. And we pair off fire and water. They're the opposites that are paired. And I know that some of that can be confusing if you've never considered it before. You're just like, well, we call air in the east because um, we call air in the east. That's how all the books say to do it. But if you've never thought about it, think about it. Why do you call air in the east? Why do you call air in the east? Do you have a reason besides that's where hermetic magicians have told you to call air in the east? Ask yourself. And then ask yourself why you're doing it the way you're doing it. And if you're doing it that way because that's the way you want to do it, do it that way. But if you want to do it so that you're drawing energy into the center and creating a focal point, then consider that. But you can't make choices for yourself until you know how this shit works. So I give you that. It's also helpful to know how the tools of your particular tradition or system work and how they don't work and how probably they're really props that you don't necessarily have to have unless you do because your system says you must have this this vessel or this thing to contain that other thing and if you don't the world's going to explode or something i don't i don't want to say that there's something that you can live without um, because there are so many within especially within traditional and folkloric um, 
within folk practices. There are some things that are handed down and that are in, in the system that, you know, I'm never going to say, you can do without it, but there might be, you know, the, I know that within mine, almost everything is debatable in the sense that um, I was taught that if you can't do it naked in a concrete room with nothing but yourself, then you probably can't do it. Um, you should be able to at some point leave the tools behind. The tools are like training wheels is probably the best way to put it. You know, there's something, um, training wheels, magic feathers, like Dumbo had, <laughs> um, you know, they're there to give you confidence in your ability. They're there to teach you what it feels like to direct the energy or what it feels like to do the thing. And maybe at most they're a vessel for holding the energy because you can't necessarily ho hold all the things. You can't keep all the plates spinning at once. Maybe, or maybe you can. Um, after enough experience and knowing what those energies feel like. Maybe you can. Um, but it's important to know their limitations and it's important not to feel so dependent on the tools that you feel like you can't do your practice without a thing in your hands to do it. Another thing that I think witches need to know is how to, how and why to perform psychic hygiene. I know that there's a lot of information out there about basic psychic hygiene um, because a lot of folks are doing some version of it, but I think that there's more that could be said about how and why it's necessary to perform. So basic psychic hygiene tasks are things like grounding and centering, banishing, shielding, and cleansing practices um, in order to make sure that your space isn't being invaded by spirits or energy that you don't want to have there or that you can get rid of just sort of the debris that accumulates when you're doing work because things get attracted to your energy and then you kind of have this residue and you need to be able to get rid of that. And then another thing that goes along with that is being able to keep spirits out including deities when you don't want to be in invocation or in possession or being ridden whatever the terminology that your system or your tradition uses you need to be able to say no it's your body and you need to be able to keep them out so if that's something that your trad does that your system does then you need to be able to not go into that. And I don't know how many rituals I have been to where a relatively new practitioner has kind of derailed things because they were like, oh, Bridget wanted to talk through me. So she just came in and I fucked everything up for you. Um, not necessarily at a ritual I was leading per se, but I've seen it happen so many times. And it's like, sweetie, that doesn't make you extra special just means that you're not far enough along in your practice yet to be able to go give me a second Bridget it's not your turn yet I'll let you talk or why don't you just come close and whisper in my ear but you don't get to jump in and wear me like a new suit just yet and you need to be able to do that you need to be able to go not our turn I'm not the star right now if you want to be able to have that opportunity, you can either wait until a little bit later and do it, or you can lead your own ritual, right? Like you set the time. And then on the other side of that coin is when it is your time to go, you need to be able, if you're going to do that, to know how to open the doors, to let that happen. You know, how to relax your grip on your sense of you enough to let spirit in, to let that other presence speak through you and, and move through you, if that's something that your system or your trad does. And I'll just add the caveat there that there are certain traditions that have the etiquette that it's perfectly fine for you to get ridden when something else is going on, but most craft trads 
if somebody else is leading a ritual and they didn't say, okay, who has a message from spirit, it's not considered appropriate. It really is part of the metaphysical training of a practitioner to understand how it is that their system, that their tradition is put together. That cosmology is part of the metaphysical training. I think that the power of the individual grows and the power of the tradition grows the more that the individual practitioners really have a good understanding of what's going on, which is one of the reasons that I'm encouraging you to learn and to study these sort of esoteric concepts. Mysteries will unfold for you and you'll just be so much more in touch with your daily practice if you dive in on these things. It's like being Dorothy and getting a look behind the curtain to see what's actually happening. So the last thing that I'm going to mention, there's probably more that I could say, but the last thing that I'm going to mention is having a good understanding of how the soul or spirit operates according to your tradition or your system. And that does vary by tradition, um, but that's part of having that good understanding of how your system is put together. So having that understanding of what the soul is made up of and how it works, um, you know, is it a tripartite soul, which is something we've talked about here on this channel. And again, I'll include links and cards, all the things. <laughs> is it a tripartite soul? Is it a cohesive, you know, all one piece kind of soul? Is it, um, does it reincarnate? Um, is it, um, is it a one-time use <laughs> soul? You know, what, what happens with it? Where does it go after death? This is going to answer some questions that you might have, or at least give you a framework, even if it doesn't give you really solid answers, because I don't know that um, anything is going to give you like really, really solid answers about that, but it's going to give you a framework for things like how spirit flight or astral travel, soul journeying, how all of that works. Um, it's going to give you a better understanding of the soul's journey. It's going to give you a better understanding of how spirit messages and communication work with um, ancestors that have passed or with the beloved dead in general. And those are um, it, helpful in the work of a witch. So in our practice. And again, I feel like we're always going to have some questions about these things and none of this is like, oh, I got that answer last Tuesday and now I never have to ask any questions again because I know everything there is to know about the craft. No. It doesn't work that way. You know, we're always learning. We're always growing. We're always uncovering new things. We're always reading something new and getting a new insight and putting a new spin on something and, um, you know, sort of growing in our practice and deepening in our practice and expanding our practice and sometimes even revising our practice. I mean, it's a practice for a reason. You know, it's, it's a craft. It's an art. It's, it's something we're always working on. Okay, guys, that's what I've got today. So I hope that you found this informative. I hope that it has sparked some interest for further study. I've definitely got book recommendations for you. So if you missed the cards um, throughout the video, then check out the links below because there's so much stuff you could read to help you uh, further your studies and your education in this. And if you have other book recommendations, please drop links for your friends to see because, um, and for me, because I'm a book junkie and um, I want more reading. So thanks and I hope to see you here next Monday at noon. We're gonna get back into some of that coven stuff that we were talking about. I'm gonna be talking about the devil and the queen. So you wanna check that out for sure. Bye guys.